Good morning, Bridgewater family. It's good to be with you uh, in this way. Let me uh, start off by giving you a little bit of an update on where we are in the process for Anna's surgery and the recovery. She did have uh, her surgery on Monday, and uh, that didn't go quite as well as we had hoped it would. Um, there were a number of things coming out of it that they weren't able to get access to uh, because it was just too risky of a procedure. Um, we knew all along that this wasn't going to fully remove all of her cancer. Um, but unfortunately, they weren't able to get some of the things that were most serious as they, as they uh, were progressing through the operation. Um, she's doing reasonably well at this point. She's healing well. Uh, she's been uh, taking some steps. Thankfully, praise the Lord for that. Um, there was some concern um, on her left leg that through this process, um, there might not be any feeling uh, or sensation in her left leg. Um, that has not been the case. Uh, she does have feelings. Uh, she um, is able to take some steps. She is starting to, to walk again, which is great. We're, we're rejoicing over those things. It's a long journey ahead of her. Um, and we pray that um, she's able to get back to, to work, she's able to function, she's able to, to be back at her apartment in Chicago. So there's just a number of things that we're hoping for and praying for um, and asking the Lord to be gracious to her in this, in this journey. So um, <clears throat> we'll continue in the process and we're so thankful for the prayers and support that we have received from the church family. That has been a huge um, help to us and a huge help to her. And so thank you uh, for all that you have been doing and are doing and continuing to, to lift that stuff. We're, we're very, very grateful for that. So, so thank you for that. Um, if you have your Bible this morning, uh, open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going today. And uh, the intent is to, to share just some thoughts related to um, what we've been studying in the course of this year. And I'm doing this through Skype or through Zoom, actually. Um, and hopefully Dan is able, able to upload this and we're able to actually get it to you on Sunday morning. Um, I recognize and I apologize that just watching a screen for a Sunday morning time frame seems a little odd. Although in these COVID days, that may seem maybe a little more customary than it would otherwise. But um, let me see if I can try to at least make it a bit more engaging. And more than that, uh, the text of scripture is engaging. And it's always what guides us and helps us as we think through how we're to, to live life. So Matthew 6 is where we're going. Our theme, as you know, this year is to, is to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Um, that comes from 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever. Amen. So the intention in our spiritual journey and in our walk is to grow in a deeper understanding of Christ and um to grow in grace, and we absolutely need both of those things in our ongoing progressive sanctification journey. So I, I hope this has been helpful, a helpful year to you. Um, there's been a lot of opportunities for growth. There's been a lot of twists and turns for all of us, I think, in, in the journey. And so we're help, hopeful and prayerful that God is using all of those things as a means of conforming us into the image of his Son. So Matthew 6 is sort of the text that we want to use today. And as a reminder, um, the, the principles of stewardship, that's what we're working through now and using the Sermon on the Mount as, as the framework to, to think about some of those stewarding components. But the framework of what we're talking about in terms of stewardship is taking um, those things that God has given to us, the responsibility to use those things well, and have some level of accountability with that. So stewardship is God-given responsibilities with accountability, and we said there are four particular points related to that um, that I'm hopeful that you know really well. Number one, God owns everything and you own nothing. Number two, God entrusts us with everything that we have. Number three, you can either increase or diminish what God has given to you, and the Lord would want you to increase it for sure. And then number four, God can call you into an account at any point, and that could be today. And so our hope and desire is that we recognize those things to, to be able to say when we have to give an account to him um, that we've done this in a way that honors and pleases him, and having him hear, um, having him say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, you've been um, faithful with little, and now you'll be entrusted with much. And so for all of eternity, we will have opportunities to honor and, and praise him, and uh, stewarding what he's entrusted to us today is an indication that we are, 
are responsible with that which he has, has given to us. So using, um, again, Matthew 6 as the text, we're actually going to be reading from uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 16. And the text may be a bit more familiar to you, but it's the whole notion of treasuring those things that he entrusts to us. So how are we stewarding the treasures and using this particular text uh, as a means of, of assessing that? Treasures would be sort of loosely defined biblically as anything that really has value to us. Those things that would merit our time, our attention, our focus, um, our desires, those things that we seek after, we spend a whole lot of time processing or a whole lot of time in our mind thinking about. It's, it's that sort of mindset. So whether that's family, whether that's our health, whether that's um, hobbies or cars or home or the things that sort of consume us, those are the things that are our treasures and how are we not only rightly seeing those for what they are, but then using those in ways that give glory to our Lord. So let's read together the text of Scripture, starting with verse 16 from chapter 6 in uh, Matthew's Gospel. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast... Anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so when if your so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And we'll stop there with our reading. Enough information, enough from the text to, to be able to help us. So through your notes and, and what we're going to talk about are just four particular considerations of what it means to be a good steward. And the first principle that I want us to see is what's the audience that really we're seeking What's the audience and making sure that the audience that we're pursuing and seeking is the right audience? Because Jesus is giving us a contrast here in verses 16 through 18. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you that they have their reward in full. But you, here's the contrast, but you when you fast, Anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will be noticed by men, not be noticed by men. But your father who is in secret and your father who is in secret uh, sees what is done will reward you. So he's drawing a contrast between the two, um, understanding uh, both the negative side of that as well as the positive and who is the audience and and. Um, why are we doing particular things to be noticed by men or doing this in such a way as to, to be honoring to the Lord? So he starts off with a negative piece of that with a level of hypocrisy. People who are fasting in a way that others might see what they're doing and somehow say, wow, that is really just a very spiritual person. This is a notice by other people of, of doing something that appears to be somewhat spiritual. Most of us today aren't necessarily in the practice of fasting, although it may be something that we should pursue more frequently. In fact, probably the whole aspect of fasting might be more that you forgot your lunch, uh, more than is an intentionality. But in this particular case, clearly, it's a matter of doing something with the expectation of having an audience view you in a particular way. And so Jesus then describes that particular individual as a hypocrite. And a hypocrite could be or is someone who's a pretender or an actor or someone who presents themselves to be one thing, but the reality is, is they're entirely different from that. And they were saying that they, 
they were doing this, they were valuing something really for the sake of other people, again, more than it was a function of doing this for the Lord. And in response to that, Jesus is saying, I say to you, you have your reward if that's what you're seeking. If you're desirous of that, if that's what you want other people to notice you, then you have received that in full. There's no further reward that will be issued and granted to you. So seeking that, valuing that, um, and, and, the, and the reality is, is we are constantly looking for an audience to appraise us. We're, we're always looking for someone to value us or to, 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 to give us the, the attaboy or to, to see the good things that we're doing. Um, and so that ought not to necessarily be the case. It's, it's really a function of making sure that we're doing this with the right audience in mind. So when we think of fasting, the purpose behind fasting from a biblical perspective is a number of things, but the primary area would have been to glorify God doing that in such a way as depriving yourself of human substance, um, uh, food, of of something that you need as a means of saying, I have a greater dependence on the Lord. So oftentimes when you see fasting in the context of scripture, it comes with praying. So it's a prayer and fasting piece that oftentimes accompanies Um, those two together with the mindset and the idea of, again, a dependence on him. Earlier we saw when Jesus was starting the Sermon on the Mount, he's he's saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's what Matthew 5, 6 says. And so we will be satisfied by seeking after him more than some sense of of um, j- just food as, as a consumption, but doing that with an idea of hungering for him, his words, the things that um, we cherish from him. So doing that in such a way as to, to glorify yourself in this hypocritical way that Jesus is identifying is really taking from God something uh, that is otherwise uh, deserving of him. He is worthy of glory, and when we begin to to steal that glory or to take that glory, we become sort of glory thieves, if you will, in the process. So that's certainly not what we want at all. You have the negative side of that, and then Jesus also, in contradiction to that, identifies um, from verse 18 a positive piece of this, the reward that can only come by faith, believing in God, who sees in secret, will reward you in secret, but the motive behind doing this is seeking an audience of one more than it is an audience of many people to, to, to view that. So our heart's desire as believers and followers of Christ are, do we seek him and, and is he the audience that we're pursuing and not other things? And so what we're doing in our private lives, as he's identifying this in secret, is significant because it's going to identify something about us. There's a difference between the public you and the private you. And this passage is directing us to to make sure that we understand and value the right audience in the right way. We're treasuring him above all else. And in that process, uh, certainly it's it's a recognition that wherever we go, God's noticing and seeing all of these things. In fact, the psalm says in, in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I make I take the wings of the dawn, and if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the lights uh, around me will be night, even in the darkness, that is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So God's seeing all that we're doing and making sure we're identifying the right audience in the process. So treasuring the things that God treasures, doing things, fasting, and otherwise in such a way as to rightly identify our audience. That's point number one. The second point that I think we should see from the text is making sure you know the location of your storehouse where are you putting your treasures? What's the, the, the storehouse or the location, if you will, of where you're putting your treasures? He says in verses 19 through 21, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is likewise doing a parallel here and giving a negative piece before he moves to the positive and drawing a contrast between the two. And a storehouse, of course, would be just the things that we value, the things that we treasure. It, it's that idea. Um, God says it is, it's fine to treasure things, but to make sure that you're treasuring the right things, making sure we have the right idea of the things that we are valuing. Because if you're storing up for yourself things here on this earth and you're valuing earthly things, there are agents that can do harm. They're natural agents, and he identifies some of those things, as well as other sorts of elements as well. So you gather things from an earthly perspective. perspective. You're going after the things that functionally will not last. They will not maintain it for some period of time, for sure, but not something that's going to have um, an eternal perspective. And so we need a paradigm shift of making sure that we're pursuing the right sorts of things as opposed to chasing after the things that ultimately will have no lasting significance. So Jesus then begins to, to bring in this moth and, and rust. Those are, again, natural elements of decay. You can spend a fortune, a whole lot of money on a new wardrobe, um, and if the, the fashion doesn't change uh, before you decide to get rid of it, over time it will just wear out. It will um, the fabric will wear out, moths will come and eat it. The point is, is it's not going to last. It doesn't have that sort of longevity. And in a similar sort of way, if, if clothing isn't necessarily the thing that you're doing or, uh, in order to present yourself in a certain way to an audience, then maybe you're pursuing other things like cars or um, things that are shiny, metal sort of, of things that, that we can easily pursue uh, after and those can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can spend a whole lot of money on uh, a new car, and in the end, particularly in uh, climates where you're just getting roads that are filled with salt, it's just a matter of time before those become scrap metal and, and rust away. So whether it's a natural process or um, or something else, it's it's just not something that we should be pursuing. And the other thing in terms of the, the other agent, displacing agent, would be not just a matter of decay, but someone who comes in and steals it. You, you would work hard for a particular thing, and someone else notices it and thinks that that's something that they want more than, than you have or possess. And so they just, they decide to take it. And the reality of living in a sin-cursed world is that you will have people who will act that sort of way, who will remove things that you have maybe worked hard for. In the process, we need to recognize that if we're putting our hope in these sorts of things, whether it's clothing or whether it's um, cars or, or other sorts of items like that, if our hope is identified by that, if, if that is our identity, we're known for those things, and we're treasuring these sorts of material things, and we're expecting them to provide lasting joy and, and entertainment, we just recognize it's it's the, the wrong focus because they can either be destroyed from natural elements or they can be removed in a matter of, of minutes from you. So bad investments, bad things either way. So Jesus is giving us a, a bit of a stock tip, if you will. It's making sure we have our treasures invested elsewhere. So investing your time and your energy and, and your resources in heavenly things that will not fade, they, they will not be taken away, they will be preserved because they're preserved and protected by God himself. He's promising these things that will have that eternal significance because he's safeguarding them and have no ability for anyone to come in and take them away. So it's mindful or wise for us to be mindful of the things that he's pointing us to, to see these things in the right sort of way. So we, we, we store up for ourselves in the right place, the right sorts of things. So identifying those things well. Um, so he goes from, again, that negative side of the equation to the positive side. So 
don't do this. On the other hand, there's some positive pieces. So um, one commentator, uh, Craig Bloomberg, says the spiritual treasure should be identified as broadly as possible. So when we're looking at those things that should be the focus of our spiritual treasure and where we're deciding to lodge those, we have to think of inclusively lots of things. Spiritual treasures should be defined as broadly as possible. As everything that believers can take, um, as everything that believers can take with them beyond the grave. For example, and if you're just thinking of what are those sorts of treasures that I should particularly be focused on, uh, the commentator here gives us a list of those. Holiness of character, obedience to all of God's commandments, souls that are one for Christ, disciples nurtured in the faith, and those are just a few. There's certainly many more than that. But in this context, however, storing up treasures focused particularly on the compassionate use of material resources to meet others' physical and spiritual needs. It's in keeping with the priorities of God's kingdom. So how am I using whatever it is God has entrusted to me in a way that God will be pleased with and that it helps advance his kingdom? And if that means helping other people in the journey and process, then how am I not just looking to store these up for my own particular use, but how am I using them in a way and in a direction that God can use and others can be edified and built up? It sort of reminds me of a plaque that I had in my room when I was growing up. Um, it said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And then a scriptural passage for me to live is Christ. Maybe you've heard that before, but that was the text that, or the, the reminder of, of a poem or a short statement that was helpful for me. So perhaps we, we need to ask ourselves how, how we are storing up for ourselves treasures in a practical way. So think with me about some of these things from, from a very practical perspective. Um, if we're not intentionally trying to nurture our soul and to, to grow in a deepening relationship with our Savior, knowing his word, understanding what it means to walk in step with the Spirit, if we're not spending time intentionally in that sort of way, we're going to be diverted and we're going to go in the wrong direction. So focusing on the disciplines of the Christian walk and what it means to, to pray and, to, and to, to read God's word and take his word in and memorize his word and, and meditate on his word, all of those things are helping me develop and cultivate a holiness in my life that I might not only honor him by reading, studying, meditating, but I would take his word and hide it in my heart that I might not sin against you, Lord. So spending that sort of time. So even assessing how I'm spending my time or how I'm spending my money, whether it be on external appearances or whether that be on, on Facebook and spending an enormous amount of time on social media sorts of things for the purpose of somehow presenting myself in a certain way. All of those things are, are considerations for us to, to think well about and making sure we're nurturing our soul more than somehow giving some external appearance for the sake of other people. Another thing that might be a good consideration from a practical perspective is how am I intentionally using the resources that God has given me to, to show hospitality, to, to, to be kind to other people. Sometimes we become a little challenged by having people over to our house because we're a little more concerned about our carpet or we're concerned about the couch or, um, it's not cleaned up or we somehow value these material things in ways that we um, we're not leveraging well in a way to sort of foster some, some growth or developing relationships or how can I um, have a deeper sense of, of connecting with body people within the body of Christ um, in a significant way more than I'm concerned about some external appearance of, of my house or, or the way that it looks. So just, hospitality that helps us think about connecting with other people, whether it's another believer in the context of fellowship and, and Bible study and, and growth and encouraging each other, or whether that's reaching out to my neighbor who's an unbeliever and how am I using my home or, or uh, things that God has entrusted to me in a way that I'm trying to love on them 
and to point them redemptively to, to the hope that's found in Christ. So it's just valuing those relationships more than sometimes we do um, the possessions that we have. So where is your storehouse is the question we need to be asking our, ourselves. And do I have that in the right sort of way? Who's my audience, number one? And then two, where is my storehouse? What has God entrusted to me? And how am I using those in a way that's ultimately pleasing to him? Okay, number three. Number three is making sure that you have clear eyes is the way that I phrased it here. But it's just making sure that your eye is clear. And Jesus is sort of using a, an analogy to help us think about this in, in a way that maybe we wouldn't otherwise think about that. So let's read the text and see exactly where he's going with this. In verses 22 and 23, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, in the contrast, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light, if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And there's a parallel passage that Luke has from Luke 11. Of 34, the eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body also is full of darkness. So what you have flowing out of verse 21 is, and then into verses 22 and 23 is just this contrast and, and the same sort of idea that he's been building on through this. So first, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean that the eye is the lamp of the body? What does Jesus mean when he says that the eye is the lamp of the body? Well, just as a lamp is a source of light, so your eye is a source of light for your body. And if your eye is not clear and you have a speck in your eye, or as Matthew 7 says, you have a log in your eye, you are blinded. Your whole body does not know the right direction to go. So the eye being healthy and working properly is critically important for the entire body. So if you've been focused on an earthly audience, wrong audience as opposed to a heavenly audience, if I'm focused on an earthly treasure rather than a heavenly treasure, I've got the wrong sort of storehouse. And if we have earthly sight rather than heavenly sight, then we have a wrong perspective and we have a wrong view. When we think about what we see, that's exactly what faith is, is it not? It's, it's the importance of an unseen God that we serve and we love. And that's what faith is. It's, it's having eyes of faith, believing what God says is true, and that we can't necessarily see the physical components of that, but we believe by faith what he has said, what he has done, and then we act on that. So the writer of Hebrews sort of helps us. He says, now by faith it is it is the assurance. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then he says later in verse 6, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So to have the eyes to see, even though we don't have a physical component, is the faith that we we build uh, on and what God entrusts to us that gives us the hope of even eternal life, because We believe what God has said and what he has done for us. So when we see even trials and circumstances and difficulties that we have in life, and and we see those as some sort of a physical encumbrance or it's messing my life up or it's it's just ruining sort of my day, I, I have to have a paradigm shift or a change in the way that I see things, that God is using this as a tool and an instrument to help me Uh, to become more like him, to teach me something about his character, to teach me something that I need to learn within me, and knowing confidently that he is presenting these things to me in a way to allow me to have an opportunity to be more Christ-like if I'm responding well to it. So God is at work molding me and shaping me and malleable into the image of his son. And my desire is to certainly want to be like that. And he's using, of course, these sorts of earthly difficulties as a means of helping us to see that. So if we want something in such a deep sort of way, 
and that's all we can see if you focus on it, it almost becomes this sort of log in our eye. The splinter becomes even more because we're so fixated on it, we're so centered on it that it skews our thinking and we can't think much past this particular issue. It just sort of keeps our attention um, in a way that that is not going to lead us into a good spot. So making sure that we have the right sorts of things in place. And, and you see that the darkness that overtakes the body when all you can see is all that you want. And that's the analogy he's using. There's this darkness that sort of consumes you when all you want is, is one particular thing and it's the wrong sort of thing. Now let's think of that from a practical perspective as well. Each of us have lists, each of us have things in our home that we want to get done, each of us have a direction in, in different, different ways. And so when a project, for example, in our home becomes so central to our thinking that it sort of consumes us, and my relationship with my spouse is, is suffering because I'm so working toward and so directed toward this, or my kids, when they're asking me something in the midst of that, become a distraction, and, and I'm just wanting them to go away and allow me to finish this project or begin to spend money on this in ways that begin to affect the budget. And it, it's just an issue. It's just something that in the moment is becoming such a consumption, such a desire in me that it, it, it begins to overtake me. And so how am I seeing that again in the right sort of way that it's an earthly thing that's a, that may not be a bad thing in and of itself, but it's consumed me in a way where it's just uh, causing me to be blind and spiritual blind because we're deceived. We're deceived into believing that this particular issue in the moment is the most important thing that I have to deal with. And nobody else seems to understand that. And if I could just get them to understand it or leave me alone so I can get it done, then, then all would be well. In that analogy, that would be spiritual blindness. And, and my eye is bad, if you will. And so something that is really interesting, certainly in the context of the Bible, and I couldn't help but think as I'm working through this passage of a member of our congregation, Gene, who's physically blind. And so we can be spiritually blinded by things. And, and sometimes, particularly in the context of Scripture, it's those who have no sight physically who oftentimes have a keener sense of spiritual insights than those of us who have physical Eyesights. In fact, if, if you go back to, well, actually in Matthew 9, you, you have an account of Jesus healing a girl at a funeral. And in this funeral procession, everybody, of course, thinks this person is dead. And Jesus says she's not dead, she's just asleep. And everybody is, of course, laughing at Jesus um, for such a statement. And then he, he has the crowd go away. He heals her. She comes out. And then immediately following that, in Matthew 9, uh, 27 through 29, and Jesus went from there, two blind men following him cried out, have mercy on us, son of David. And he entered the house. The blind men came up to him, to Jesus, and said to them, or he said to them, Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord, yes. Then he touched their eyes saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. Here you have um, and a, uh, someone who had a keener insight believed even when they had no physical appearance, uh, no ability to see, rather. So here, uh, I'm also reminded that Jesus, Jesus um, did not look like anything special. In fact, the writer of Isaiah, um, or Isaiah says, Isaiah 53, 2, uh, that there was no beauty that we should desire him. So there was nothing particularly appealing about his physical appearance, yet he was of extreme worth. He was the pearl of greatest price, if you will, even to use another analogy from the New Testament. So significant. In fact, Jesus says of himself, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. And so if we're valuing to see clearly, you must see with eyes of faith, with the eyes of faith based on what God says is important. And the thing that is most important is himself. God is the pearl. He is the greatest of all of those things. So how are we pursuing him, even in terms of our number one point of the audience of one? So pursuing him, having a storehouse in the right sort of direction. Um, thirdly, making sure that we have clear eyes. Um, and then the last point 
is making sure that we have the right master. That's exactly where the text takes us in verse 24, making sure we have the right master. No one can serve two masters. And we try to all the time serve two masters, but no one can serve two masters. And there's no wiggle room in that clear statement. You can't serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Categoric statement, trying it all the time, can't not do it. And throughout this whole passage, the Lord is just making these contrasts, these contrasts, these contrasts of both, the earthly and the heavenly, the temporal and the eternal. And so the Lord says, saying here is you can't serve both. You can't have half measures. You can't do at some point just sort of pursue things in your own sort of way. And then later on come back to the saying, well, I'm just going to have the Lord for some period of time following that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. We like to think it does, but it doesn't. Not only does that go against the character of our Lord, because he will not share his glory with another. He is zealous in that sort of way. That's what Isaiah 42, 8 says. So it goes against the character of the Lord. It, it, not only that, but our own heart doesn't work that way because it eventually is going to go in one direction or another. We think we can ride the fence. We think we can be on the rail and sort of do both. And the reality is, is we can't do that. Our heart will draw us in one direction or another. And if it's not pursuing righteousness, it just inherently will go in a direction that's pursuing worldly pursuits rather than pursuing him. So if you're trying to approach the Christian life where you think you can have this perfect balance and that you're able to do the, them both, it's not going to work. That would be a lie. That would be a deception. That would be a wrong way to think about it. Eventually, you will fall. So truth, the truth is, is you, you are a servant, not a master. You are a steward, not the owner. Not a, you are a servant, not a master. You are a steward, not the owner. And making sure we identify or embrace that identity and the honesty that we have to have on wanting to pursue being the master, but yielding that always back to a sense of what God has entrusted to us. So he's the master, I'm the servant, and how am I responding to the things that he has for me? So if we serve wealth, there's always the idea that we're somehow going to gain enough to, to be in charge. And that's another lure and deception that we can easily be pursuing. We think if I just have enough money, then I can pursue whatever it is I'm wanting. But the reality is, is we, we continue to, to wrestle with that. When's enough enough? And we just want more. We want more. And that greed sort of continues to consume us. Having some financial freedom to do then whatever you want is the lure and deception that we oftentimes fall into. So people who are driven by money, consumed by that, that just getting more and more and more so they can have it is the wrong thing. They are still a servant to the unrelenting taskmaster of more. I came across that quote. I thought it was great. Still a servant to the unrelenting taskmaster of more. Wealth can be an unrelenting, terrible taskmaster. The contrast to that is going back to a really good master and a really good God who loves and cares for us. Because this is exactly what he says in Matthew 11. Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I've clung to that particular promise this week when I've been thinking about weary and heavy weight, because there are things in our lives that will be very burdensome and be very heavy laden for us. So we're to cast our yoke upon him and learn from him, gentle and humble in heart. So even our labor of our master, it leads us to, to rest. When we serve him, it leads us to a rest and a peace and a joy that ultimately we cannot get from anything else that's temporal. Psalm 16, 11 says this, You will make known to me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. 
So brothers and sisters, let's make sure we have the right focus, that we have the right audience, the audience of one, not the audience of many. We're not seeking to be men pleasers, we're seeking to be God pleasers. Number two, that we have the right storehouse. We're putting our treasures where they will not rust or be destroyed or thieves break in and steal. And that our eye is clear. We're rightly seeing um, who he is, the light that he, he, he gives to us. We're walking in the light. We're confessing our sins. The light is exposing things in my life in such a way as to repent of those things and, and to be drawn back to him. And he is our master. And he's the one we're pursuing. And in him, there is joy everlasting forevermore. So make sure we have the right focus and the right sorts of things and stewarding all of those things that God has entrusted to us well for the honor and glory of his grace. Right. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful for your goodness that you have extended to us. We're grateful for this, the, the things that you have, have entrusted to us. You are the owner of all things. You entrust us with things, and we want to steward them well. So help us to treasure the thing that is most valuable, you and you alone, and help us not to be deceived into thinking that other things can ultimately satisfy. They will not, maybe for a a period of time, but ultimately not. So help us, Lord, to see those things well, and may you be pleased and honored with how we choose to respond to those things. For the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I love you and uh, hope it's a great week for you. Uh, Have a great week in the Lord.